The reason I'm not liking it is because I haven't got the shape. I want it to go. Well, they might like to, but I don't give a shit. I mean, I do what I want, to be honest. Let's stop buying our records and I'll say goodbye and do something else. Become a strip artist or something. Yeah? What, to what music you would strip? What music would you use? All the songs I've written! <laughs> Freddie Mercury is celebrated as an all-around great person. Renowned for his flawlessly sublime voice, incredible vocal range, dazzling and theatrical outfits, and electrifying stage presence. Queen's amazing songs are unforgettable, but Mercury was far more than the sum of his flamboyant parts. Here is why Freddie Mercury is an epic legend. Freddie Mercury's flamboyance and great sense of humor are well documented, but one of his lesser known antics involves taking Princess Diana out for a disguised night on the town. According to comedian Cleo Rocos, she, Mercury the princess, and a few friends were hanging out one night watching the Golden Girls when they decided to head to a notorious gay bar. Diana wanted to go, but didn't want to be recognized and mobbed by photographers. In a resourceful move, Mercury dressed her in drag. Fully decked out, she looked like a rather eccentrically dressed gay male model, and she and Freddie spent the evening giggling like naughty schoolchildren. Many great artists love cats, and Freddie Mercury was no exception. According to reports, he had up to ten felines at one time and even had them painted onto a vest he wore. His adoration of his cats frequently made its way into his music, his album, Mr. Bad Guy, was dedicated to one of his felines and to all the cat lovers across the universe. Despite the quirky lyric about not liking Star Wars and Bicycle Race, Freddie Mercury thought highly enough of the film to endorse it by singing, while perched on the shoulders of Darth Vader, or at least a roadie dressed as Vader. In 1980, around the time of The Empire Strikes Back, Photographer Tom Callens captured a shot of Mercury and the Sith Lord hamming it up during an encore performance of We Will Rock You. It was pandemonium, Callens recalled years later. Everybody just thought it was so funny, so Freddy. It was so over the top. When it came to seizing inspiration, Freddie Mercury didn't take any chances. Afraid of losing songs and melodies, he had a piano installed as a headboard and famously used it to lay down tunes that would come to him in the middle of the night. Being flexible, he'd simply reach around and start playing the riffs backward. It's said that Bohemian Rhapsody was initially conceived this way, though Mercury apparently disliked playing the song live because he considered himself a mediocre pianist for some reason. Freddie Mercury's declining health was challenging, but he was determined not to let his failing body diminish his creativity, work ethic, or passion for life. According to Brian May, Queen's lead guitarist and backup vocalist, Mercury's last days were surprisingly full of joy. Freddie was in pain, but inside the studio there was a sort of blanket around, and he could be happy and enjoy what he liked doing best. Sometimes it would only last a couple of hours a day because he would get very tired, but during that couple of hours, boy, would he give a lot. Even when he was particularly ill and exhausted, Mercury, like his friend and collaborator David Bowie after him, soldiered on through sheer will and artistic commitment. May recalls, when he couldn't stand up, he used to prop himself up against a desk and down a vodka, saying, I'll sing it till I fucking bleed. Now that's rock and roll. Born Farak Bulsara in Zanzibar, an island off the coast of Africa, Freddie Mercury grew up in a close, loving home where his artistic inclinations were encouraged. His parents, his sister, and his community celebrated his beautiful voice. Freddie's father, Bomi, passed away in 2003, and his mother, Jir, died in November 2016. Several years before her passing, Jir granted the telegraph an in-depth interview about her dear boy. Whatever he did or wore, I always saw in him the same child I knew. He would tell us lots of jokes and I could always connect with him, Mrs. Bulsara recalled. It reassures me that he is still loved by people all over the world, but of course none of them love him as much as his mother. As a deeply religious person, she claimed to be mostly at peace with her son's death, though she had moments of sorrow. 
Once, while watching the Olympic closing ceremony, Freddie's face suddenly appeared on the screen and she cried out, Oh, my dear boy, where are you? I miss him so much. They showed John Lennon too, but there was much more applause for my Freddie. Freddie Mercury always spoke of his longtime girlfriend, Mary Austin, as his soulmate and the love of his life. Freddie met Mary when he was still struggling and unknown. They lived together for seven years, supporting each other through thick, thin, and Freddie's rise to fame. Although their physical relationship ended after he realized the true nature of his sexuality, they remained best friends for the rest of his life. When Mercury died, he left Austin the bulk of his estate, including his mansion in London. As Mercury put it, our love affair ended in tears, but a deep bond grew out of it. And that's something nobody can take away from us. It's unreachable. All my lovers ask why they can't replace her, but it's simply impossible. Though Freddie Mercury didn't officially announce to the public that he had AIDS until the day before his death, his close friends were aware of his illness, and he made sure they knew he wanted the fight against the disease carried on in his name. Shortly after Mercury's death, Brian May, Roger Taylor, and Jim Beach established the Mercury Phoenix Trust to fund AIDS charities worldwide. The organization has also helped launch numerous medical research projects and vaccine studies, endeavors that the famously generous Mercury would have been thrilled about. According to his schoolmates, Freddie Mercury was just as charismatic in his youth as he was in adulthood, leaving his friends with a treasure trove of inspiration and fond memories. Known as Bucky because of his famous overbite, young Freddie was once just a shy 12-year-old prodigy starting his musical career in the little hill station of Panchgani in Maharashtra. His childhood friends describe him as an artistic introvert who opened up in the presence of those he knew well. He was also socially ahead of his time. One friend noted, he was a prodigy. He could play anything. He had the unique ability to listen to a song on the radio just once and be able to play it perfectly. His voice never changed over the years. If you listen to a Freddie Mercury CD, it sounds just like the young Freddie did back then. The same friend remembered that in school plays, Mercury often played the women's roles. He had a habit of calling the boys darling, which was slightly shocking back then.